of course, as many of you know, of course, I have worked for the Roman Society since uh, 2007 and the Hellenic Society since 2019. So uh, it's a great pleasure to be speaking now. Um, and many of you will have already have heard earlier this year, Peter Saracy's lecture in February on the title Justinian, Holy Emperor and Demon King. And if you missed it, it's still available to watch on the Roman Society's YouTube channel, where you can watch most of the Roman Society's lectures and the Hellenic Society has one as well. Um, Peter's lecture was based on his new book, uh, Justinian, Emperor, Soldier and Saint, which has now just been published, in which he argues that Justinian was a very attentive to administrative details via extensive legislation, as well as imposing order on the law codes, and that in his recasting of the Roman state as an orthodox republic and his greater intolerance of heretics and pagans, he laid the foundations of medieval Christendom. Peter in his lecture emphasised the need not to rely so much on the classicising history of Procopius, who wrote up the account of Justinian's wars against Persia in North Africa and Italy, but to pay much greater attention to the theological and the domestic aspects of Justinian's reign. And today I want to further investigate some of these actions of Justinian and indeed Theodora against the background of cultural change, which was evolving during their reign. And I've just put uh, on this uh, first slide um, uh, a contrast um, between a sort of more Romanized uh, image of Justinian. I'll talk about this a bit later on this gold medallion next to his most famous church, Hagia Sophia. And as I say, I'll talk about both of those a bit more later. The sixth century saw a period of intense theological activity when competing doctrines argued by Rome and within the Eastern churches were increasingly directed by the emperor himself in what was a blurring of the secular and the sacred rule, this rise of the notion of Caesaropapism. And when Justinian and Theodora both used religious policy as part of their foreign policy, they encouraged missionary activity and they did a great deal of church building. Justinian also clapped down on paganism, persecuting heretics and pagans to a greater degree than most of his predecessors. But at the same time, in the cultural life of the empire, its festivals and literature, we see the classical and the Christian existing side by side. And so our authors equally able to produce both classical and ecclesiastical works, while new forms of writing, for example, hymns, became increasingly popular. So first, I want to add a little bit of context to the Empress Theodora. And here she is in San Vitale in uh, Ravenna, looking down from one of the walls. She would have been facing Justinian on the wall opposite, of course. And I want to look beyond some of the more popular stories that many of you will be familiar with from Procopius's secret history. And it's particularly apt that we should think about this work now, since the year 2023 marks the 400th anniversary in 1623 of the discovery of the secret history by an Italian Catholic priest of Greek descent, Niccolo Alemanni, a renowned classical scholar and teacher of Greek. He had been appointed secretary <coughs> to Cardinal Borghese, who served the Pope, and was made custodian of the Vatican Library <coughs> in Rome. After writing his at least superficially positive wars, it was known that Procopius had written, but seemingly never put out to circulating, a ninth additional volume to his wars, in which he turned against Justinian and his general Belisarius. It was a manuscript copy of these unpublished materials, known in Greek as the Anecdota, 
Mr. Alemani discovered and published with a Latin <laughs> translation as the Historia Arcana, the secret history. Benazarius, far from being Justinian's great, incisive general, was portrayed as indecisive, easily swayed <coughs> at his wife Antonina, and Justinian was denounced as a demon king, bent on the destruction of mankind, whose head would detach from his body and float around the palace late at night. <laughs> there are some memorable descriptions of the Empress Theodora, including the well-known stories of her antics on stage with these pecking barley grains from her body in a loose representation of Leda and the Swan. We cannot totally dismiss the allegation that she was a prostitute as gossip from the hostile Procopius, since a brief reference from the sympathetic bishop, missionary and historian, John of Ephesus, confirms her origins in a brothel. Theodora managed to escape from this life in the theatre as the concubine of a certain Hecabolus of Tyre, who had purchased the governorship of Cyrenaica, and she travelled with him as far as Alexandria. Here, she would become familiar <coughs> with the doctrine Miaphysitism, that is to say, those who believe that Christ has a single nature with a human and divine aspect. This was the exact opposite of Diophysitism, whose exponents believe that the divine and human natures of Christ were separate. Diophysitism had been adopted at the previous ecumenical council, the Council of Chalcedon, held in 451, and was accepted by the Church of Rome, but not all of the Eastern Patriarchates. The Patriarch of Alexandria was a firm Miaphysite and was currently hosting, when Theodora visited, the exiled Miaphysite Patriarch of Antioch, the very powerful Bishop Severus. However, after a quarrel with Hecoborus, Theodora was left to make her way back to Constantinople, where she met Justinian, probably through her connections with the Blues, the Blues being one of the four certain <coughs> factions, groups of supporters of different teams at the games, particularly for the chariot races held in the Hippodrome. Now, apart from questions about Theodora's somewhat uh, surprising meteoric rise, for which the law needed to be changed to allow Justinian, the senator, to marry a former actress, the more interesting questions concern the extent of Theodora's power and her influence over Justinian. She looked after the interests of her own family, making advantageous marriages for her illegitimate daughter, whom she had before she married Justinian, and her grandchildren, and her own sister was married to Justinian's friend, the General Sitas. She carried out acts of patronage, church building in Antioch, and gifting a precious cross decorated with pearls to Jerusalem. It's thought that she influenced Justinian's legislation, which sought to improve the status of women and to stamp out prostitution. And some of Justinian's laws, the novels, stipulate that the oath that they would carry out their duties should be sworn by officials to both the emperor and his wife. And we can see a celebration of their coal rule <coughs> in the inscribed epigram in the church of St. Sergius and Bacchus in Constantinople, now known as the Little Hagia Sophia Mosque built in the 520s or the early 530s, so quite early in the reign of Justinian and Theodora. Uh, and I've just given a view of the outside um, and of the inside, and running around the, um, uh, the tops of the pillar is the, inscri is the inscription. Part of the inscription reads, but in all things may Sergius guard the sovereignty of the sleepless emperor and increase the power of the God-crowned Theodora, whose mind is embellished with piety, whose unceasing labour exists for her unsparing efforts to nourish the poor. So many of Theodora's actions look like the benign and innocent desires of a consort to support her husband in causes in which she took a personal interest. At other times, this support was less clear-cut. She was responsible 
to the exile of Justinian's effective, if deeply unpopular, finance minister, John the Cappadocian, framing him in a plot to replace Justinian with his general Belisarius. And in two other areas of policy, with far-reaching consequences, views are divided as to the purpose behind Theodora's actions. So the first concerns Justinian's plan to restore Italy to under the rule of the Eastern Roman Empire from Ostrogothic control. Now, in the early 530s, in 533, Belisarius had set up for Constantinople to recover North Africa for Justinian, which he did so within a year. Um, North Africa had been held by the Vandals for much of the 5th century. Justinian celebrated his general's victory with a traditional Roman triumph, and although fighting was able was to break out again and continue until the early 550s, he was now ready to uh, turn his intention to Italy. But on the throne was Amalasantha, the daughter of the powerful Ostrogothic king Theodoric, who had been ruling Italy since the 490s, supposedly on behalf of the Eastern Roman Empire. Um, and it, this is a portrait bust um, of someone who it thought was Amalasantha, um, which was uh, it's definitely dated to the late 5th, early 6th century, and it was found in Rome, quite close to the Lateral Basilica. Amela Sansa herself was a powerful queen, extending the territory of the Ostrogoths into the Balkans and engaging in talks with Justinian's envoy, Peter the Patrician. Her qualities are extolled by her Praetorian prefect, Cassiodorus, but her position was not unassailable. In choosing a Roman and literary style of education over a Gothic military style of education for her son, Asalaric, she angered some of the Ostrogoths, and as a result, fearing for her safety, she prepared to seek refuge in Constantinople. In the end, though, she did decide to remain in Italy, <laughs> and after the death of her son, she appointed her cousin, the Odahad, you can see one of his coins here, as a co-ruler. So her fears, in fact, were well-founded, since he had her murdered on the island of Malta in Lake Volsena. Procopius, in his Wars of Secret History, makes Amalasantha's assassination the pretext for Justinian's intervention in Italy. <coughs> Just as he had made the murder of King Hilderic, a usurpation by Gelimer, the reason for his invasion of North Africa. But there is another complicating factor here, <coughs> that of the role of Theodora. Procopius also suggests that Theodora's jealousy of Amalasantha had led to a plot to her murder through the agency of Peter the Patrician. Correspondence between Theodora and the Ostrogoths, including letters between Theodahad and his wife, Gudeniva, which referred to a secret mission, possibly confirm the suspicion that Theodora was implicated in the murder of Amalasantha. And certainly there are some letters in which it's clear that Theodora had requested Theodahad to consult her first before Justinian. But here lies the uncertainty. Do we believe Procopius's theory of jealousy? So maybe Theodora, Michael of her lowly origins, was not keen to see the arrival of the learned Ostrogothic queen in Constantinople as a possible rival? Or do we see this as a carefully thought out plot between Justinian and Theodora to contrive the murder of Amalasantha and thus provide a pretext for the war? This was one particular occasion, albeit with far-reaching consequences, where we have cause to question the role of Theodora. Running throughout their reign was the issue of doctrinal differences throughout the empire and between the imperial couple. That explained earlier how we think that Theodora came to take up the cause of Miaphysitism. Justinian himself was an ardent diophysite, an adherent of the Council of Chalcedon. Even before he became emperor, he had tried to work with the Pope to effect a reconciliation between Rome and the Church of Constantinople, which had been in schism for many years. 
Palestinians and Theodora's different views have been viewed with puzzlement today and also by their contemporaries. She housed up to 500 Miaphysites in her palace in Constantinople and built refugees on Chios and in Thrace, the banished Miaphysite clergy. And on one occasion, as we'll hear a bit about later, she even sent out a rival missionary delegation. Did they really fundamentally disagree, or was this another carefully stage-managed piece of clever co-rule? It is possible that Theodora's support for the Miaphysites meant that they were less likely to rebel against Justinian, allowing him to favour the pro-Chalcedonians and therefore to maintain peace with the Church of Rome. So here we come to the next part of uh, this uh, talk. Justinian as God's representative on earth. Um, and here is an image of Justinian looking a bit more like a Christian emperor, um, as I'll say a bit more about later. So successive emperors from Constantine onwards had sought to find solutions to the doctrinal divisions and church organization between the East and the West, and within the Eastern Patriarchates of Antioch, Alexandria, Jerusalem and Constantinople. To Justinian, unity was of the utmost importance as he sought to unite the East and the West politically and to claim his divine right to rule. It would take a long time to go through in detail all of Justinian's actions to try to reconcile the Miaphysites and the Diaphysites, but he did host seven meetings in Constantinople between them. He composed an edict of faith and in 553, he called the Fifth Ecumenical Council in Constantinople. For this council, the Pope Vigilius had been escorted from Rome as early as 545 to lend his support, although this was hardly forthcoming willingly. During his reign, we can see Justinian becoming increasingly autocratic in his desire to find or impose a solution dismissing popes and patriarchs and appointing those more favourable to himself. The Pope Vigilius tried to protest at some of these, although he himself had benefited from Justinian's interference in papal appointments in the past. The importance of theology to Justinian can be seen in his legislation, where he often reiterates his divine right to rule in the prefaces to his novels. For example, in one of them, he says, from the time when God set us up to reign over the Romans, we've been making every effort to do everything to help the subjects of the state entrusted to us by God and doing whatever may free them from every difficulty, harm and grief. Thus, for litigation and other reasons, they are forced to depart from their homeland and suffer overseas. He felt responsible for legislating on church matters, addressing laws to patriarchs and in bishops on ecclesiastical discipline. And it wasn't all idealistic. Some measures had practical consequences. A number of novels strengthened the position that ecclesiastical property was a inalienable, arguably at the expense of lay aristocratic landowners with whom Justinian had clashed. Pursuit of orthodoxy could also be used as an excuse for war, such as reclaiming North Africa from the Vandals, who were seen as Aryan heretics. Another practical way in which religious policy and secular rule coincided was in the way that Justinian managed his foreign policy using religious conversion and acculturation to secure the loyalty of those on the periphery of his empire. Along the eastern frontier in the north, um, there's a map there, just uh, um, the geography. Um, in competition with the Persians for the loyalty of Latsica, an important place strategically, in the 520s, Justin had provided a lavish reception for their king, King Seth, in Constantinople, when he was baptised and endowed with the regalia of office. And Justinian repeated the same exercise when he bestowed the tradition of the regalia on Seth II, following the murder of his brother Gubatses. And while the king Gubatses might have been tempted to defect to the Persians on occasion, their dislike of the Persian religion of Zoroastrianism 
proved to be a more powerful incentive to stay with the Romans. Shared beliefs also helped to encourage the allegiance of the Iberian king Gurgenes, and Justinian used conversion in controlling some of the neighbouring pe Caucasus people, such as the Tsali and the Abasti. At the southern end of the frontier, Justinian also sought to use one of the influential Arab groups, the Jathlids, against the Arab client tribes of the Persians, the Nazrids. Interestingly, in 542, Theodora, at the request of the Jathlid leader Al Harith, sent two bishops to provide suitable care for the Miaphysites of Syria and Arabia. One of the bishops was one Jacob Baradeus, who went on to become one of the foremost Miaphysite leaders responsible for the conversion of huge numbers of Arabs. And so I question why Justinian would not have been disturbed by this development when he otherwise devoted a great deal of time promoting diophysitism. However, here I think we need to see this as a measure of Justinian's pragmatism. On the volatile eastern frontier, it was most important to keep the Jathlis within the Roman political orbit by any means possible. On the Egyptian frontier, a similar situation arose with the emergence of the Kingdom of Nevadia. Responding to a request to send missionaries, it's very likely that Justinian saw the conversion of the Nobadai as a means to securing peace on the southern Egyptian frontier and as part of his mission to bring civilization to barbarians. And he arranged to send ambassadors with gold and baptismal gifts and gifts of honor for the king and letters for the Duke of the Sibais through whose territory the delegation would pass. His delegation was strictly orthodox and believers in the Council of Chalcedon. However, as recounted by the Miaphysite John of Ephesus, Theodora was also asked to send an embassy, and she therefore sent a rival delegation with a letter to the Duke of the Thebais. Inasmuch as both His Majesty and myself have purposed to send an embassy to the people of the Nobodai, I am now dispatching a blessed man named Julian. And further, my will is that my ambassador should arrive at the aforesaid people before his majesty's. Be warned that if you permit his ambassador to arrive there before mine, then do not hinder him by various pretexts until mine shall have reached you and have passed through your province and arrived at his destination, your life shall answer for it. For I will immediately send and take off your head. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, what Justinian thought about this royal delegation, <laughs> we don't know. It's not recorded. <laughs> yes. So another way in which Justinian could both demonstratively carry out his duties as emperor and underline his relationship with God was with his building program. It was the emperor's job to provide amenities and services, places of worship and protection from enemies by ensuring that defences were in good order. Procopius's panegyrical work, The Buildings, gives a comprehensive list of Justinian's building projects, although perhaps not all of them were actually begun by Justinian himself. Writing a panegyrical work, Procopius was pleased to um, uh, uh, attribute to Justinian some previous projects started by earlier emperors. Now, in 532, Justinian had faced the greatest threat to his reign when the Blues and the Greens circus factions unusually joined forces to remove him from the throne and to install another emperor, Hypatius, the nephew of the previous emperor Anastasius. Theodora, according to Procopius, made a stirring speech, persuading Justinian not to flee. And Justinian sent in his troops, and 30,000 were killed in the Hippodrome. Justinian's position was safe, and the destruction of the city centre in the days of rioting cleared the way, quite literally, for Justinian to reshape his area of his capital. Um, this is just... Um, the, the picture of the, hip, the Hippodrome, the area um, today. 
Um, Justinian rebuilt the churches of Hagia Irene and Hagia Sophia, which a bit more later. Connecting more closely the church and the imperial palace, uniting the religious and the civic ceremonies of Constantinople. And close by, he constructed uh, the Basilica system, the Yerbatan Sarai, um, which is a popular tourist site today, which I'm sure many of you have been to. It's always lit up with uh, floodlights. Later in his reign, Justinian built the Church of the Holy Apostles in Constantinople, uh, no longer in really surviving, where he and Theodora were buried. Of the most significant churches across the empire, there's the Church of St. John the Theologian in Ephesus, churches dedicated to the Virgin Mary and the Archangel Michael in Antioch, which he rebuilt after Antioch was sacked by the Persians in 540, a new church to Mary in Jerusalem, a church at Sinai to mark the site of Moses and the burning bush. Here, there's an, an inscription was found on a roof beam commemorating Theodora for the memory and repose of our late Empress Theodora. And here again at this site, we can see some evidence for the dual purpose of this project. As Procopius tells us in the buildings, that there was also a fortress there to impede the incursions of the Arabs. Now, other ways in which Justinian needed to demonstrate his role as just God's representative on earth was to root out heretics and pagans throughout the empire. One of the most well-known of these measures is the so-called closure of the Academy of Athens in 529, thus bringing to an end a centuries-long tradition of philosophical education. Although the reality is rather more complex. Our evidence for this comes from a law of Justinian in which he targeted heretics, Samaritans and pagans, referred to as Hemines in the Greek, by forbidding them to teach and earn a public salary. And a reference in the 6th century chronicle, Chronicle of Malalas, refers to a decree sent to Athens ordering that no one should teach philosophy. Another law, passed a few years later, stipulated that pagans, here described as those infected with Hellenic bloodless, must be baptised, prohibited from teaching and receiving a public salary, their property confiscated, and they be exiled. But why should Justinian single out Athens in his decree, but allow philosophy to continue to be taught in other centres, such as Alexandria? And did this mean that there was no more philosophy at all in Athens? It's important to note that the philosophers who did leave Athens, there were seven of them, they tried uh, going over the border to Persia. It's important to note that they were all pagans, Christians were quite at liberty to stay and teach philosophy. And it's thought that Justinian was far more comfortable with the sort of philosophy taught in, for example, Alexandria, where the focus was much more on sort of theoretical paganism and a shared ancient cultural heritage <coughs> than the in Athens, where cult, magic and pagan ritual were privileged. Another episode, which is far from clear-cut, is Justinian's actions towards Philae in Egypt, where the gods Isis and Osiris were still worshipped. Procopius suggests that the general Narses, set by Justinian, brought down the sanctuaries on the order of the empire, put the priests under guard, and sent all the statues, the pagan statues, to Byzantium. But again, we can question some of the details of this account because uh, the temples are quite, still quite well uh, preserved. Um, we've got um, a, 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 an image of a, a Christian cross carved into um, a column, so it isn't the case that the um, temples were completely destroyed. And we know that there was a bishop there, at least we know definitely in the 4th century, so it shows a much more fluid picture there. It isn't the case that this was just a pagan site abruptly brought to an end by Justinian, and it was more likely to be something more like a sort of symbolic closure. But we do know that there were three waves of persecutions, in, especially focused in the capital. 
as early as 527, perhaps to make a point at the beginning of his reign, a law was passed introducing measures against heretics and pagans who were barred from holding high office or inheriting an estate. Investigators found a number of high profile figures, but although one committed suicide, we don't actually hear of any executions. In 546, in this case, perhaps to reassure himself of God's favour, after a series of disasters, the 540s a period of when the plague struck, and as a result of food shortages, there was earthquake damage. Um, a second investigation was conducted, focusing on outing prominent senators, grammarians, lawyers, and physicians. And towards the end of his reign in 562, again, this was a year marked by rioting and conspiracies against the emperor, there was a third investigation when several priests in cities throughout the empire were arrested and cult statues were destroyed and some sacred writings publicly burnt. Um, so it seems that Justinian didn't have a sort of overall program of persecutions, but that he sort of responded to perhaps when things were, he felt that things were not going so well in his empire. He thought this was a sign of God's disfavor and that he should, he should react. But even these persecutions, sort of, they don't amount to a sustained anti-pagan policy. Um, and as I come to sort of the third uh, section, that of cultural change, um, I'm showing you here, um, it's basically two images for contrast. Um, so we have um, a gambling machine um, that um, was um, from Constantinople, uh, depicts the um, depicts the chariot races. Um, the idea is that then you could put uh, coloured balls off the reds, whites, greens, and blues into the top, um, <laughs> and it, as a chance, whichever one would reach the bottom first um, uh, would win. These kinds of things were um, banned in about five, three, four, um, but um, this was. was from about that period. Um, and I'm just juxtaposing that with a picture of Hagia St. Uh, Irene, one of the churches which uh, Justinian rebuilt after the Nico of rioting 532. Now, when it comes to forms of public entertainment, Justinian found himself in a difficult position since the old adage of keeping the populace happy with bread and circuses remained true despite the patent disapproval of the church for the immorality of the theatre and the pagan associations of the festivals. The Bishop of Fatnai, a priest called Jacob of Sarug, composed a large number of homilies, about 700, including lines such as, Satan wishes to set up paganism by means of the play. Arguing to Christians who claim that this was just innocent entertainment, who can wallow in mud without being dirty? <laughs> um, despite being God's representative on earth, Justinian's policy towards public entertainment was very much guided by political expediency. Back in 521, he had celebrated his consulship with extravagant games, including the exhibition of wild beasts, 20 lions and 30 pouncers, we are told by the chronicler Marcellinus Comings, even though these wild beast shows had in fact been banned by the previous emperor Anastasius. It seems that Justinian may have been alarmed by the popularity of one of his rivals, Vitalio, who had celebrated his own consulship the previous year with magnificent games before being murdered possibly by Justinian. Similarly, Justinian looked to reinvent rather than cancel festivals, which had previously pagan association, transforming them into imperial ceremonies. One example of these is the Brumalia festival, originally very much connected with pagan celebrations around the winter solstice, hence the name Bruma, the winter solstice. By Justinian's day, though, 
it be, it had become a long holiday of 24 days, starting on the 24th of November and finishing on the 17th of December. Each day was associated with one day of the Greek alphabet. And the idea was that individuals could invite their friends to dinner on the day associated with the first letter of their name. <laughs> and a panegyric by the Greek writer Curicius of Gaza celebrating this and celebrating Theodora's day on the 1st of December, the 8th day for Theta, the 8th letter of the Greek alphabet, and Justinian's day on the 2nd of December, the 9th day for Iota, the 9th letter of the Greek alphabet. By the 10th century, this festival had become very much part of the imperial calendar of events, with the emperor awarding his, official with, his officials with bags of gold in alphabetical order um, before receiving the acclamations of the people. As with this gradual rebound branding of pagan festivals, we can also trace changes in imperial ceremonies. For example, in 534, Justinian celebrated his victory over the Vandals with something like an old Roman triumph, and a mural painted on the ceiling of the vestibule of the imperial palace depicted the imperial couple approached in supplication by the defeated Vandal king. We have a description of it from Procopius, even though it obviously doesn't survive. Towards the end of his reign, though, in 559, Justinian marked his victory over the Kutrigers. This was a sort of a Turkic tribe who had threatened um, the walls uh, to the north of Constantinople. Um, and he celebrated this with, with an Adventus, a formal entry into the city in which he stopped off at a church to give thanks to God and to pray for the soul of Theodora, who died several years ago in 548. <coughs> the trails of Justinian also changed over time. Few survive, but they appear to combine elements of the Roman imperial tradition with new features designed to highlight his closeness with Christ. This massive gold medallion of Justinian dating to 534 to 5 um, is an example of this. This is um, because the original had disappeared in 1831, a cast survived from which some electrotypes were made. Um, this is the one in the British Museum. On it, Justinian is presented as a Roman emperor, wearing a breastplate, military cloak, diadem topped with a plume dress helmet. And on the reverse, he's pictured sitting astride a horse with winged victory, carrying a palm frond and captured weapons. The legend describing him as the salvation and glory of the Romans. On the other hand, we hear from Procopius of a lost colossal equestrian statue of Justinian, which had stood in the centre of Constantinople. We don't know, uh, we have Procopius's description, and we also have this 15th century drawing, now in Budapest. Again, the emperor is presented in a breastplate, headgear with plumes, but he doesn't hold any weapons. Instead, he's extending his right hand towards the rising sun, which Procopius interprets as ordering the barbarians, presumably the Persians here, to stay at home rather than make war against the Romans. In his left hand, he holds the orb and cross, a sphere representing the world topped by a cross, a perfect example of a Christianized imperial symbol, Justinian securing the empire with the help of the Christian gold. Lastly, we can see the coexistence of the classical and the Christian in the literature produced during the reign of Justinian. It's perhaps not surprising that the works of the Christian authors and poets of the day who had enjoyed a classical education are infused with classical, pagan culture at every level in thought and expression. In the 9th century, the patriarch and scholar Photius struggled to understand how committed 6th century Christians could write so fluently about classical myths and pagan gods. But the literary culture of the 6th century was far more fluid. Justinian himself made use of archaizing language in the prefaces to his novels on provincial forms. But I just want to look at two pieces of the literary output 
concerning the celebration of one of Justinian's enduring achievements, Hagia Sophia. Hagia Sophia rebuilt uh, after the Nike riot in 532, was first consecrated in 537, and then again in 558 after the Doe had to be replaced during an, uh, after an earthquake. We know from Procopius in his buildings, he gives a detailed description of the church and its magnificent internal decoration. But it's the works of Romanos the Mellowed and Paul the Silentiary I want to consider here. Romanos the Mellowed was a Syrian hymn writer who arrived in Constantinople at the beginning of the 6th century, had a dream in which he swallowed a scroll from the Virgin Mary, and you can see him swallowing the scroll there. <laughs> and he went on to write more than 800 hymns, inventing a new form known as the Kentakium. He wrote in a more sort of unsophisticated Greek, closer to the spoken language, with a sprinkling of classical century Attic Greek forms and poetic vocabulary, despite his explicit rejection of a classical education and dismissal of pagan sorcerers. He wrote a hymn, number 54, to celebrate the first official inauguration of the church in 537, writing that the church imitated heaven and contrasting its speedy rebuilding with Solomon's temple in Jerusalem, which still lay in ruins. He praised Justinian and Theodora, celebrating them as saviors of Constantinople through their prayers and re rebuilding of the city. But for the rededication ceremonies um, in the 560s, December 562, January 563, after the dome had been reconstructed, Justinian instead chose the poet Paul the Silentiary. Paul, holding an office at the imperial court, was highly educated. He produced a large number of classicizing poems, many of which were included in the collection called The Cycle, put together by his friend, the historian Agathius. Paul's ekphrasis, his description, begins and ends with a double panegyric to the emperor and patriarch and emphasizes the ecclesiastical significance of the ceremonies. But in keeping with his classicizing style, he sort of tries to avoid explicit Christian terminology and in, in this and many of the other works. So he calls churches temples, and this is something that many of the 6th century classicizing writers did, especially Procopius, for example. Paul uses as his models earlier Greek poets, including Homer, and he had a good knowledge of Latin poets, which was becoming a bit more unusual in 6th century Constantinople. He imagines in his description that Justinian is visited by Roma, the personification of New Rome or Constantinople, who encourages him to build the church after the collapse of the dome. Roma, so the classical figure, but not a pagan goddess, was an ideal character for Paul, who wanted to write in a classical style, but couldn't afford to be too explicitly pagan. It's thought that in his choice of Paul, Justinian betrayed his earlier ambition to leave the city and his reign with the splendours of the classical past. So in conclusion, there are many paradoxes in the reign of Justinian. He showed an increasing interest in theology and staged several waves of persecution against the pagans and heretics, but he used the past and the ideal of restoration to justify his wars his provincial reform legislation and to promote his capital. My view of Justinian is that he was above all a pragmatic emperor. He may have been God's representative on earth and a genuine diophysite himself, but as with how he managed his joint rule with Theodora, his measures were driven by expediency, protecting his borders and need for unity throughout the empire and keeping his subjects entertained. Religious policy was inextricably linked with foreign policy, but the classical past of the empire was hard to escape, leading to a demonstrable overlapping of the classical and the Christian in the cultural life of the empire throughout his reign. Yes.